The two pro camera champs of 2022 couldn't be more different if they tried. Buckle up for a different kind of camera chat. If you're wanting me to shoot two photos and zoom in to 1000% and talk about the gooder color, that's not gonna happen here. This is a chat about photography philosophy and what really makes for a better phone camera experience. If you're not down for that broader chat, you, you can just turn this video off. You can escape now. But if you enjoy more nuance and operation in your comparisons, I think you're gonna be in the right place. I also need to get a couple disclosures out of the way. I've done paid hosting and consulting work for Sony in the past, and I'm currently doing a sponsored series of videos for Vivo. Neither manufacturer is paying for or influencing this conversation, but I've been pretty close with both brands currently and in the past. The Vivo X80 Pro and the Sony Xperia 1 Mark IV currently take my top praise for smartphone cameras this year, and they're almost polar opposites in terms of features and what they both do well. I would say both are refining your phones for their respective manufacturers. We're not seeing radically different hardware from Vivo or Sony, yet both are nearly top to bottom polished improvements over the phones that they launched in 2021. These two labels are camera-centric, content creator focused products. They're built to take photos and shoot videos, but how they accomplish those tasks is critically important. As an overly simplistic description, the Sony is handily the most camera-like phone on the market today. If you're familiar in the slightest with how a DSLR or mirrorless camera operates, an Xperia is going to be awesomely familiar. The hardware is flatter and it's easier to hold, the dedicated shutter button is excellent, and there are separate apps for photos, videos, and more cinema-style shooting. The idea being, if you're working, you're likely trying to focus on a specific kind of content and you want a minimum of distraction, and you also don't want to be in an app that can accidentally swipe modes on you while you're trying to control camera settings. It's less smartphone-like, but it's better for framing and composing. Your viewfinder is rarely ever blocked by menus or settings. It's like a real camera. The Vivo, by contrast, is a lot messier. This is a more traditional phone app. It still maintains a ridiculous amount of options and controls for your media, so things can get a little cluttered depending on what mode you're trying to use. Like in video, the right side of your viewfinder still needs to house menus for other modes, so they're on your screen, and you kind of lose the ability to focus on the right third of your frame. Everything is in one app, and that is easier when you're switching modes, but it's a lot more to chew through to find the settings you really need. To really get a handle on what a Vivo can do, I think the Vivo camera app comes with maybe the steepest learning curve of the year. But I also think the folks who take the time to get familiar with this app will be well rewarded for what the app can accomplish. Okay, getting back to some hardware differences, main sensor to main sensor, Sony played this year more conservatively. For the 24 millimeter equivalent lens and sensor, it's still a good size. It's larger than a half inch, but this hasn't changed significantly since the Xperia 1 Mark II. The Vivo, on the other hand, the main sensor is one of the largest available in a phone today and has the fastest aperture available at the sensor size. The sensor is nearly the same size as 16 millimeter film and the equivalent optical performance of this hardware resembles the look you would get from a full frame camera with a 24 millimeter lens at f5.6. That's mind blowing for a phone. This looks pretty much the same as this wide open and not through software or a portrait mode. We're talking optical equivalent lens performance. Now, Sony didn't push the boundaries on their main sensor as aggressively, but their companion sensors are fantastically improved. The telephoto has a real mechanical optical zoom and both ultra wide and telephoto match the main sensor in clearing data extremely fast. All three rear cameras can shoot 4K video at 120 frames per second. And if you switch to 4K 30, you can swap between all three sensors while shooting video in one clip. You don't have to stop shooting, switch sensors, 
and then shoot again. The Sony is easily one of the most brilliant video creation platforms available in a mobile today. The Vivo can shoot brilliant 4K60 from the main sensor and the ultra wide and can also shoot 8K30 outperforming some phones like the OnePlus 10 and the Galaxy S22. The companion sensors don't quite match though. First, we need a pair of telephotos to more closely match the Sony's single mechanical zooming lens. We get a two time zoom for portraits and a five time zoom for longer telephoto reach. And then the sensors don't match for capabilities. They're chosen for very specific strengths. Neither telephoto is used for 4K video. They're included more for better photography capabilities and they're only really gonna be used for video when you're shooting 1080p. The two phones trade blows in really interesting ways. Sony's cameras shoot very practical. Sony's have the least processed output, the least dramatic HDR or AI influence. Instead, they use that AI hardware to speed up autofocus and subject eye tracking. Vivo subject tracking is pretty good. Sony's tracking is spooky good. It's Skynet good as it locks onto the eyeball of your subject. But there's a flip side to that. Conversely, Vivo is probably the winner this year for HDR and computational low light performance. It's genuinely the best image processing I've seen. And the dedicated coprocessor sets up the fastest night mode capture I've ever used with the brightest and most accurate output from any phone this year. It's stunningly good at figuring out the correct colors of your shot. And I'm shooting in near blackout conditions. And before any lame complainers wander in whining about phone night modes, I don't want my shots to be brightened. That's not authentic to the scene. Shots at night should be dark, am I right? Shut up. Be better at tech. If you don't want this crazy awesome night mode processing to be this bright, then turn the exposure slider down or shoot a normal JPEG. How do you think I got the before shot to do the comparison? Why do I need to spoon feed you this and spell it all out? If I can shoot this and I can shoot this, don't you think I can shoot basically anything in between? Oh no, the night mode is too good at brightening up an image and exposing colors properly and reducing noise. Who would want that? This is what that scene roughly looks like to the human eye. My neighborhood gets dark at night and you can make that image with the Vivo as easily as you can make this. It's one button press. The rest of us techies who enjoy cool features on our phones, we're not going to look back for you as you get left behind. But I digress. Whew. Now, the Sony totally can't compete here in a direct sensor to sensor fight, but I think it's admirable what the Sony can put out in terms of low light images. There's this mis mis idea that Sony somehow doesn't have a night mode. They do. There is a low light image processing and it's actually pretty good. It's just not going to be as dramatic as some of the, the, the brighter night and today modes that we see uh, more popularly on Samsungs and iPhones and Pixels and on the Vivo. Again, the Sony philosophy is more conservative. I think a photographer would likely use a tripod and have some additional control over lights or a flash if they were planning to shoot in darker conditions like that. And I think the Xperia is built with a similar idea in mind. So there's way less of the fun stuff on a Sony and the Vivo has all the fun stuff. There's a huge range of processing and filtering available. Not just a portrait mode, but a portrait mode that tries to model the optical characteristics of old Zeiss lenses and can even warp bokeh behind your subject. You can take that to an extreme with anamorphic style image compression and J.J. Abrams style light flares. But if your tastes are more traditional, that computational approach can also be used to improve images for editing. Super RAW is fantastic. It's not RAW in any kind of traditional sense. It's not a single piece of unedited data directly off the sensor. It's a computational stack of RAW files repackaged into a single DNG. It's a little like the new expert photo app on a Samsung, but it's just built 
into the normal Vivo camera app, you don't have to download anything. And again, you can capture insane dynamic range with lower noise and a ton more information to edit with. And this is what makes computational photography so exciting. The Vivo sensor is already closing in on mirrorless cameras. The binned pixel size is about 18% smaller than the pixels on a camera like the Lumix GH6. So then you add AI and coprocessor capabilities to stack data and stack it about as fast as a similar exposure with a longer shutter while you're hand holding the phone. I mean, that's just, I've, I've genuinely run out of adjectives to describe that. Insane, beastly, incredible, wowza. Anyone looking at the current slate of premium tier phone cameras, and we're talking across the board, we're talking Apple, Samsung, OnePlus, Google, Motorola, Xiaomi, Vivo, and Sony, Anyone looking at these distinct pros and cons and this radical evolution in practical, optical, and computational output, the areas where we can drive these cameras harder than ever before. Anyone who can look at all of that and shrug off some BS about the average consumers do the simple things in a world of aggressive photo sharing and TikTok is terrible at technology and they have to be terrible at photography. Phone cameras have never been more exciting, but there's no way to share that excitement if all we're doing is trying to arrive at a single number score, grading these cameras on the most simplistic operation. All of these premium tier shooters have gotten so much better. It's my assertion that Sony and Vivo are taking the top spots for pro imaging, even if they're approaching pro in fundamentally different ways. So that's gonna wrap it up here, folks. This was easily one of my most requested videos, looking through my comments, comparing the Xperia with the Vivo. So I hope that explains some of the philosophical differences that I've seen in shooting a ton of samples from both of these phones. So I will, of course, drop some links down below where you can find more information on the Sony Xperia 1 Mark IV and the Vivo X80 Pro, uh, maybe where you might be able to shop some of these puppies online, depending on region and availability. As always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, subscribing to the channel. All of the support lately has been absolutely fantastic. Folks who have been looking at the links under in my descriptions, checking out my website, somegadgetguy.com, or all the people that have joined the list of names scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This list is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the universe. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet at some gadget guy on the Twitters and the Twitch, on the Facebooks and the Instagrams, and I will catch you all on the next video.